Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm Danielle Humphrey, one of Monsignor Harrison's attorneys. I'm joined today by his other attorneys, Kyle Humphrey, Craig Edmonston, H.A. Sala, David Torres, and Jared Thompson. We're here today to address the outrageous demands made by Bishop Joseph Brennan, threatening Monsignor Harrison to drop his lawsuit or else face punishment. We want to make it clear to the bishop and to Monsignor Harrison's supporters that under no circumstances will Monsignor Harrison stop being a good Christian. He will not abandon his community, he will not give up his constitutional right to religious freedom, and he will not give up his lawful pursuit of justice. At this time, I'd like to introduce Kyle Humphrey to talk about the documentary evidence you've been provided with. Good morning. The packet that we've made available to you is to allow people to see what we've been seeing and what we've been dealing with uh, in our battle on behalf of Monsignor Harrison. It is unfortunate that the retaliation and the threats and what we believe to be imminent punishment, unjust punishment from the bishop is happening. Uh, but based on the last letter that we received, we believe that that's an inescapable, inescapable conclusion and that the demand that Monsignor Craig stop acting as a Christian, that he not be allowed to pray with others, is too much to bear. So I'll direct you very briefly through what we've received. This all began on April 24th with the initial letter from the bishop called a precept letter Bishop Ochoa placing Monsignor on administrative leave. He was told to cease ministerial activity, to stop dressing as a priest in public, and not to talk to witnesses. He has abided that. Thereafter, because of the vagueness of that, Mr. Edmondson reached out to the bishop through his attorney and asked for clarification. And we have abided by that clarification which is no public celebration of the Mass, no administrative acts at the parish or the school, and no public teaching, preaching, or presiding in the capacity as a Roman Catholic priest. Monsignor Harrison has complied with that. As you know, he's given 33 years of his life to the Roman Catholic faith. We later learned that a new administrator was being placed into St. Francis Parish. We were told with almost no time to react that Monsignor Craig Harrison should remove his personal property from the rectory in the parish. Thereafter on October 9th, 2020, we received a letter from the bishop indicating that he was going to go forward with punishing Monsignor Harrison for not dropping his lawsuit. He made a demand of Monsignor Harrison that suing the bishop violated a canon, which is much in dispute, but he called on him specifically to give up his rights and to do so within two weeks. He also, also falsely stated in that letter, without fact checking, which has been a problem throughout this process, that the diocese, specifically the bishop who's in charge of it, and Bishop Ochoa never checked facts, claimed that Monsignor Harrison retrieved his property rampaging through the parish with 50 supporters. We demanded the videotapes and named the members of the, of the parish council and the deacon that allowed Monsignor to properly retrieve his property. It was shocking and disturbing to see the bishop make such an additional false claim. We responded to the bishop on November 2nd advising the bishop that we would not submit to his retaliation to his bullying or his threats of punishment 
that Monsignor Craig Harrison will pursue his rights to justice and will not drop his lawsuit, even though he's being forced and compelled to by the bishop or being punished for the very fact of standing up against the people who defamed him, including the bishop, he simply is not going to abandon his lawsuit. We responded, it sent that letter to the bishop, and the bishop responded that he was in fact now going to punish Monsignor Harrison and said that he gave us two weeks to drop the lawsuit and he's sad that we didn't, but now he's coming after Monsignor Harrison. That was followed by the last letter we received on December 1st, it was actually received later, they keep using the wrong address. But the last letter telling Monsignor Craig that in spite of the, the initial precepts we put on you, what we told you you could not couldn't do, we're now telling you that you can't pray with people. We're now telling you that you can't even wear dark clothing because someone might think you're a priest. Monsignor Craig Harrison is one of the most spiritual, charismatic and amazing men that has ever served the faith. But more importantly, he's an amazing man who served his community. He cannot accept restrictions that tell him that if your child has cancer and you went to him as a friend, he could not pray with you. That if you had suffered loss and you needed that person, even if not a Catholic priest, but that person who'd been present in your life for decades as a companion on Christ's path, that he is not welcome to talk to you at all or to speak publicly or to eulogize a friend when he's made it clear that he's not there as a Catholic priest. He refuses to be placed into isolation and seclusion and to stop doing those things a Christian man would do. So we have provided you the documentary evidence of that. And I'd like now to turn the podium over to Mr. Sala to address some of the implications of what's happening. Thank you and uh, good morning. You know, we're here today because what Bishop Brennan has done, specifically what he has done to Monsignor Harrison, is an affront to fundamental fairness and it is an affront to due process of law. Our country is based and is a country of laws. No one is above the law, not even Bishop Brennan. Back in October, I believe it was October 9th, and you have the letter in your packet, the bishop sent Monsignor Harrison a letter. In that letter, he directed Monsignor Harrison to drop the civil lawsuit for defamation against the bishop and against Teresa Dominguez. He did not cite in that letter any legitimate basis to support his directive to Monsignor Harrison to drop a lawful and a valid claim that has been filed, and Mr. Edmondson will address that momentarily. He just directed him to drop the lawsuit and cited a code in canon law, and that's specifically uh, 1375. I have reviewed that particular section and it does not justify Bishop Brennan's directive to Monsignor Harrison to drop a legitimate civil lawsuit against, he, against him and against Teresa Dominguez. There's nothing in that provision, in my view, that would in any way support or give authority to the bishop to issue that directive to Monsignor Harrison other than pure fiat because he does not, in my view, want to be subjected to what the truth will reveal and that is that these accusations against Monsignor Harrison are baseless and are false. 
Imagine if someone could tell you, to, if you've been wrong civilly, that you have to drop the lawsuit because I'm telling you to drop the lawsuit because it doesn't benefit me. It's not in my best interest. That's absolutely wrong for him to have done that. And that's why we are here, because we view the, that behavior as retaliatory, vindictive, and unsupported by any facts that, that can be shown to be true. He cannot, should not have done that, and should not be allowed to continue. What he did in that letter is not only he directed Monsignor to drop the lawsuit immediately and gave him two weeks to do so. He said, if you don't drop that lawsuit, I will punish you. I will punish you either by suspending you or excommunicating you from the church. That is absolutely wrong. That is not what this country is about. He is not above the law. He cannot tell Monsignor Harrison to drop his lawsuit and have his day in court to have the issue of whether or not he was defamed fully litigated in the discovery process and ultimately decided by 12 jurors or by a jury uh, of his peers. And that's what, Mons uh, what Bishop Brennan is telling him to do. You cannot have your day in court, Monsignor Harrison. You cannot have all this fully vetted and seek to vindicate your name, and protect your interests from false and defamatory accusations just because I, Bishop Brennan, say so. Absolutely wrong and it's contrary to our system of laws and what we see in, in the uh, justice system. And that's why we're here today because we are outraged of this behavior. This is not something that should, be, should take place and we want to advise the community of the wrongfulness of what is happening in this threat and this directive by the bishop to have Monsignor drop a valid and lawful claim for defamation. Good morning. My name is Craig Edmonston. I'm representing Monsignor in the, uh, in the civil in the civil cases. First, I want to start with the word unforgivable. What the diocese and the bishop has done is unforgivable. Back in May of last year, the diocese went to the media, not just any media, the biggest and largest and self-proclaimed most listened to public radio station in the United States, based in San Francisco, KQED. They went there and on live radio, they made defamatory statements about Monsignor Craig Harrison, accusing him falsely of acts. Monsignor Craig Harrison did what any upstanding citizen would do and exercised his rights for redress in the courts. He filed a lawsuit in February of this year against the diocese and the perpetrator at the diocese of these defamatory statements to seek redress, to clear his name, to restore his reputation and to hold the diocese and the bishop accountable for these wrongful acts. What was the diocese's response? The threatening letters that Mr. Humphrey and Mr. Sala just referred to. Drop your lawsuit, Monsignor Craig, that was based on our defamatory statements that were broadcast nationwide. Drop your lawsuit or we're gonna punish you within the church. That's what this legal case is about. The legal case is in Fresno. It's just in the beginning of the case due to the COVID pandemic and the, the stress on the court system. The case is moving very slowly. So to compare it to a baseball game, it might be in the first inning. 
But this is the third case. The other two cases have already been before judges in the Kern County Superior Court. Two different judges have already found that Monsignor Craig Harrison has established and proven a prima facie case of defamation in those cases. It's akin to a judicial certification that the lawsuit may move forward, and indeed the lawsuits have moved forward. There's further questions about the nature and extent of the lawsuits or specifics. I'd be happy to address them, but um, at a later time when the attorneys take questions. Thank you. When I learned of the bishop's response and his mandates requiring Monsignor Craig, in essence, to refrain from practicing his faith. I was hit with a mixture of emotion. Those emotions initially went from anger in me, questioning my Catholic faith. Ultimately, it gravitated to that of sorrow. And the sorrow was for, the, for Monsignor Craig after realizing that he has devoted well over 33 years of his life to the Catholic faith and to God, as well as many communities in the state of California. The bishop is presumably the leader of our flock, the leader of our diocese. But what the bishop must understand is that Monsignor Craig's caring and praying for others. He has nothing to do with being a Catholic priest, but has everything to do with the way, the type of person that he is, of a caring nature, and has everything to do about his humanity as a very compassionate person, his humanity as a man. Monsignor Craig has prayed for me, my family, and others in this community. We would expect nothing less. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Jared Thompson. Uh, you know, one thing that we also wanted to uh, mention today and this overriding theme of the bishop's complete lack of due process and fairness, uh, it's not just these letters, which are extreme and terrible and should concern any uh, freedom-loving person in this country. Um, it, it's a pattern that's been going on since the beginning, since uh, April of 2019 when this occurred. Um, the bishop and the diocese has completely failed to give Monsignor Craig any due process, uh, any fairness. And what I mean by that is uh, throughout these um, nearly two years, there have been repeated offers from our side, from Mr. Humphrey, from Mr. Edmondson, to have Monsignor Craig speak to the bishop, to have him interviewed by the diocese. Uh, that offer has been extended multiple times, never once, has the uh, bishop or the diocese taken us up on that offer to have Monsignor interviewed so that he could give his side of the story. There's been a complete failure by the diocese to conduct even a, uh, the appearance of an objective investigation. Uh, they've refused our offer to interview independent and unbiased witnesses uh, to the alleged events that could disprove many of the details of these false accusations. Uh, they, they've completely failed to do anything but follow their own agenda. Um, and so these letters highlight, I think for us, the complete lack of objectivity, the complete uh, lack of fairness, the complete lack of due process uh, that this bishop has undertaken and how he's approached these accusations. Um, and I think it's worth noting the two police agencies that interviewed Monsignor Craig, the, the Bakersfield Police Department and the Merced Police Department, who 
did give an objective review of these accusations, both came to the conclusion that these accusations were not credible, that there was absolutely no corroboration for them. And I think it's, it's sad, it's a sad day when you have an agency of men willing to give that objectivity, but an agency of, of God is unwilling to do that. Um, and, and I think, uh, I think these letters just highlight a very uh, sad state of affairs in the diocese and the fact that Monsignor Craig will never get um, a fair or objective review uh, by this bishop or by this diocese. And uh, with that, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Or Ms. Humphrey. Excuse me. At this time, if you have any questions, we're available to answer them, and we'll do our best to direct them to the appropriate attorney. What do you guys believe um, has changed with the diocese, given how much they've stood behind Monsignor Craig in the past? Uh, these allegations came along much before, and things like that. Um, what do you guys believe has changed, or have they given you any reason why um, they, their support has fallen off? I'll let Mr. Humphrey answer that. The. Um, Bishops have changed. We had a wonderful bishop in the past, uh, followed by Bishop Ochoa, who is, I think, a, a will be able to establish as we pursue our lawsuits, uh, deeply involved in uh, what Bishop Brennan's, Brennan is doing now. We brought what was happened essentially is an outside bishop came in, and truthfully, Monsignor Harrison was the most popular priest in the entire diocese. And I don't know what the personal animus was, but it's apparent it exists. But again, if people follow it, there was new laws passed extending the liability to the Catholic Church, specifically creating a longer statute of limitations. Those law changes were fought for by the plaintiff's personal injury bar that uh, has a, a whole industry focused solely on gathering money from the Catholic Church and the hundreds of millions of dollars. They have various allied attorney groups and other groups that push this and try and get a lot of publicity. And now we have the new bishop of this diocese confronted with a lot of lawsuits coming down the pike and where they failed to protect innocent children in the past, they are always going to err on failing to protect innocent priests now. They don't want to look bad, and that's what's changed. Yes. What is the potential punishment that uh, Monsignor Harrison faces through the canonical process, and how will that process proceed if indeed it does proceed? We've spoken to people who have more knowledge of canon law than we do, and there is a range of potential outcomes. My understanding is that it's really in the bishop's discretion. He could seek any range of punishment from a suspension to even excommunication. What were those? Excommunication and? Suspension, laitization, or excommunication. Is Harrison on, still on paid leave? He is. That's how we characterize it, paid leave, not paid suspension. Correct. Paid leave. There was a... Uh, Can I take her question? Sorry, is there a chance that he will ever be reinstated? We hope so. Can you repeat that? Is there a chance that Monsignor, that Craig, sorry, Monsignor Craig Harrison will ever be reinstated? Uh, again, I, I hate to keep jumping up. Uh, with this current bishop, and the attitude that's been displayed, I would be shocked if there's any opportunity at all for him to ever return. As we stated at the beginning, I believe that unjust punishment will be happening in days, if not weeks, and they will do what they can to destroy Monsignor Harrison for not giving up his civil rights and his freedom of religion to pray with other Christians. Sorry, just a follow up to that. Who's reviewing his case now? Does it get handed over to the Vatican? What's the next process of reviewing his case? 
again, this is secondhand information. I'm not a canon lawyer. You have to have certain qualifications. But the process is essentially the bishop, in this case, Bishop Brennan, decides how a case will be investigated, decides who will investigate it. For instance, having Teresa Dominguez completely involved in the investigation, although she's the subject of, of the lawsuit, one of the subjects, he handpicks people that will review whatever they decide the investigation is, decides whether or not Monsignor Harrison is allowed input, and in this case was not allowed input, and then makes a decision because then it's an accomplished event. Monsignor at that point, depending on what happens, Monsignor Harrison may have some redress in the Vatican, but that could be two or three years down the road. And that's part of why this retaliation and telling him that he cannot open his door to those in need as a man with faith in Jesus and as a man who would open his door to whether you were an atheist or a devout Catholic or anything else, he would open his door to help you. He can't shut his door for three years and wait for Rome to correct a wrong. And that is why we're not going to drop this lawsuit. Are there any people from the Vatican involved in this case at all? I can't really comment on that because there's a... To me, as a, as a attorney in America, following a system of due process, there are things that happen in certain orders. I do believe that based on, on what I think has happened in this case, that there may be attention focused on this, at least knowledge of what's happening to Monsignor in Rome right now, but whether that's risen to the level of formal intervention by uh, Rome, I don't know. Have you or any members of uh, Monsignor's uh, legal team met directly with anyone from the, from the uh, diocese, or have your communications only been in letters? Let me have uh, Mr. Edmondson address that. So uh, to attempt to answer your question, the contact we've had is with the lawyers, the attorneys for the diocese. It's a law firm in Fresno. So the contact, there's been no um, attempt to resolve the case. The contact has just been a motion filed by the diocese and their lawyer to throw our case out of court, similar to motions that were filed in the two other cases, which judges here, two separate judges denied, found in our favor, said that we had a prima fit, we'd proven and stated a prima facie case of defamation and the lawsuit should go, go forward. So the, con the contact has been limited to the litigation and the contact between the law offices. We don't have a hearing date uh, yet. We're waiting on that from the, from the Fresno court. As of now, um, is, is uh, Monsignor Craig still conducting regular mass or, or funerals or anything like that? Or is that something you plan on doing during this, during this uh, waiting period? No, Monsignor Harrison has followed the precept from April 24th. He has not conducted public mass. He has not conferred the sacraments of the faith. Uh, in Catholicism, there are very specific sacraments that only a priest can conduct. He has not done that. Has he been to funerals and stood graveside and eulogized? Yes. When your mother, who passed of cancer's caretaker, who five or six years after your mother passed, when, when she passes away with cancer and that family says, can you say a few words? Yes, he's done that, but not as a Catholic priest. As somebody who loved somebody and cared for them. So he has followed the precepts insofar as he understood them. And as I said, we did not get this backwards looking uh, redefinition of what he could and couldn't do until he refused to drop his lawsuit on their demand. And all of a sudden, they're going to punish him 
and it's for things like saying a eulogy, let's remember this person as a man, a Christian man, and not as a Catholic priest. So he has followed the precepts, but he has not turned his, his back on people who need him, understanding he's not doing that as a Catholic priest. The, the bishop's letter specifically mentioned uh, Rosina Doors, uh, celebration of life on Saturday, December the 5th. Did, did uh, Father Craig attend? Did he eulogize in any way? Well, after the bishop's letter, that was canceled. The, 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 the service was canceled? Yes. Are your offices planning on filing any more lawsuits against anyone else? You know, right now, our, um, our plates are full, and this has not been uh, a pursuit that hasn't cost time and money and effort that we've all willingly given and will continue to give. But we are most, uh, at this point, concerned about what the bishop is doing to Monsignor. We've always wanted our day in court. And as Mr. I'll let Mr. Eds Edmondson address that, but we have not been allowed to do anything to begin the civil process to get witnesses deposed. Uh, again, I defer to defer to Mr. Edmondson on that. Do you have a specific question regarding the uh, uh, litigation process or witnesses or depositions or something like that? The, um, and we haven't been, after the lawsuits filed, normally the cases proceed into what's called the discovery phase. That's where we can take the dep deposition of the bishop and the, the bishop has to answer questions under oath, truthfully, supposed to be truthfully. Um, we can take the deposition of other people at the diocese who are involved, independent witnesses, things like that. They will have the right to take the deposition of Monsignor. So. And another question, um, any other alleged victims filed any other civil suits Have any alleged victims filed any civil lawsuits recently? To my knowledge, there haven't been any. In fact, uh, virtually all of these people, as far as I know, are anonymous. It was uh, said that, um, I believe it was the uh, Tulare County had found that some charges to his accusation were true, but that the time to file was already expired. How, what do you say about that? Kyle, you want to address that? Uh, what you're, you're uh, talking about is I'm sorry. That's okay. The unfortunate consequence of ethical misconduct by the Fresno District Attorney's Office. We have filed a state bar complaint. It is pending. She has a history of that conduct. What they said was an investigator within the District Attorney's Office thought there could be uh, credible accusations. These being the same accusations that were made in 1998 and 2002 by the same person that were found to be not credible by law enforcement and by the Diocese of Fresno in their own investigations. Uh, there is, we believe, a connection between people uh, around uh, uh, Ms. Dominguez and around the district attorney. Uh, the district attorney is allowed to, dis to say whether a case will be filed or not filed, but is not allowed to make statements to influence litigation. That statement was made precisely to influence litigation and to become a talking point even though there was no evidence to go forward on. And statute of limitations, everyone knew about that from the beginning. The entire Fresno investigation should have consisted solely of, as a legal scholars, as trained attorneys, this is outside the statute of litigations. But they took it an extra step to condemn on senior with half truths. Those are not true. We want our day in court, we will fight them. Another reason why we have to go forward and we will not let the bishop's threats of retaliation and punishment stop us. The 
bishop's letter uh, refers to uh, Facebook postings inviting parishioners to participate in ministerial activities. Uh, is, is, what's he talking about there? Uh, would you describe these as ministerial activities? Well, Monsignor, uh, in his process of dealing with the loss and the suffering and the emotional pain of having everything that he's done destroyed, his life destroyed, because of the conduct of the defamers, within the precept letter, made the mistake of saying, I'm going to post my reflection on Jesus on Facebook. I invite you to see what I say, not as a Catholic priest, but as Craig Harrison, a Christian. And now changing the rules, apparently, that is acting as a Catholic priest. And again, that, that is the outrage that we feel. How do you take a man who became a priest because of his call to serve the Lord and tell him to hide and not talk? This is America. We have the freedom of religion. We have the freedom to reflect on Christ's meaning in our lives. And if we share that on Facebook, does that make us a Catholic priest? I hope none of you have dark clothing because the ridiculous idea that if you have dark clothing and you're seen in public, you're tricking people into thinking you're a Catholic priest is just more of the outrage that we feel. How's, how's uh, Monsignor Harrison doing personally? You know, how's his demeanor, his attitude, and his disposition? I think his life since April of 2019 has been a series of impossible decisions and days filled with impossible suffering. He's been so much a part of our community in terms of his friends and family and those that know him and to see his reputation destroyed his ability to serve God as a priest taken, now his ability to simply serve his community as a Christian man, being told he has to give that up. I think that knowing that by us releasing this information and telling the bishop publicly that we will not sit back while you bully and retaliate, the Monsignor's suffering is the greatest I've seen it because he knows that he has opened the door through his faith as a person to draconian, unjust, and corrupt measures by the bishop. Does he hope to serve again as a, as a priest? And if not, uh, does he have any plans uh, to, to counsel people in a professional capacity in some other way? I don't know what his plans for the future are. I know that he has been counseling people that need him, but not as a Catholic priest. He is a trained counselor. Um, and he's not a man that can tell you when you knock on his door, my daughter committed suicide. He can't tell you to leave. So if that's what the bishop wants to condemn him for with these rules that have moved the goalpost, so be it. It's unjust and it's wrong. But Monsignor authorized this press conference and this press release, the release of these documents so that you would understand what he's being asked to give up and so that you would know and those who support him and those who have faith would know no church, no bishop can tell you to stop being a Christian, can tell you to stop praying. Does he believe he'll wear the collar again? I think his service and love of the church is so great that that would be the outcome that, that would heal everything for him. But I'm afraid that we're past that. I absolutely believe that the vindictiveness that's been shown that the lack of due process, the lack of an adequate or fair investigation. 
I just don't see that as a possible outcome. I hope I'm wrong. Any other questions? How many people, uh, and maybe you could identify them, have been uh, accused so far of, of defamation in this case? I'll let Mr. Uh, Edmondson address that. He's much more skilled in that area. So there's, there's three different cases. The first one is the Harrison v. Brady slash Roman Catholic Faithful case. So that was the gentleman that held the uh, press conference at the uh, Marriott and published all sorts of defamatory statements, invited the media, did, sent out a press release, and um, you know, um, said all sorts of bad defamatory things about Monsignor. So that's one. So that's Mr. Brady and his group, Roman Catholic Faithful. The second one is the uh, monk, uh, or the, um, the man who claims to be a monk, uh, Justin Gilligan, a.k.a. Uh, Ryan Dixon. And uh, he went to the media here in Bakersfield with a, uh, the California and the print media and the TV with a statement filled with lies, false statements, uh, defamatory statements. And so he's now a defendant in the Kern County Superior Court. And like I referred to earlier, both of those cases, the judges have said that Monsignor has established a prima facie case of defamation. Those cases have been uh, given the green light by the, by the courts to move forward. Um, so it's Mr. Gilligan, a.k.a. Ryan Dixon, and Mr. Brady slash Roman Catholic Faithful, in addition to the diocese. Is that it? And then, and then the third case is the one against, excuse me, um, Bishop Brennan and Ms. Dominguez? Right, the diocese. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, the case that we started talking about earlier today. Right, and that's in Fresno. Can I, I asked you the same question, the last question I asked uh, Kyle and also uh, all the folks on your side of the podium there. Do you believe Father Craig, Monsignor Craig, will, will wear the collar again? Ever? I defer to, uh, you know, I just repeat Kyle's answer. Obviously, uh, I don't really think I have anything more to add on that. But, um, you know, in, in the cases that we're concerned with here, um, there's a lot of accountability uh, that um, the diocese need, needs to be held accountable for what they've done when they go to a, the biggest public radio station in the country and defame their still current employee. Not good, not good conduct. Uh, this question is to Mr. Torres. Um, Being, uh, this question is to Mr. Torres. Sure. Um, Knowing that military law is different compared to civilian law, how would canon law be handled in, in this case? I actually have no uh, experience or training in the area of canon law itself. That's, uh, that is in and of itself a specialty within the Catholic uh, Church. Just like military law would be? Military law, just like military law would be itself. Uh, it's something that's totally different. But, uh, I'm aware of only through this particular case, but not in the other states. Let me clarify that very briefly. A canon lawyer must be approved by the church. There are certain requirements. The only canons I know are current or former priest or bishops or uh, I believe there are two or three canon lawyers in Kern County that represent the church, uh, as well as run their parishes. Uh, it is a, a very specialized area where the only thing that matters to them is church law. And we as civil or other attorneys, we're not allowed to practice it uh, and it take probably years for any of us to even begin to seek an approval process. Is that it? Yes, sir. Well, thank you all so much.